All right, so let's um, turn our attention, uh, since we've gone through each of the terms, is, is let's turn our attention first to uh, depressants. And obviously the first and major one of the depressants is alcohol. Um, and uh, ethyl alcohol is what it's referred to, the, the um, kind of chemical name is ETOH. Um, and alcohol, and, and uh, you see below you a brain scan of, of a woman who has alcohol dependence versus a woman without it. And one of the things that jumps out as you're paying attention and looking at it is this, the ventricles, how much, uh, how enlarged they are, which essentially means that you have an atrophy of brain tissue um, in the use um, uh, in, in the uh, brain tissue itself as a result of the al alcohol dependence. So, um, so essentially, uh, the alcohol is, uh, as many have heard over and over again, is a disinhibitor uh, by its nature, uh, in, sorry, um, inhibitor, and that's why it, it is functions as a depressant. In other words, it depresses certain functions, which means it depresses inhibitions. And therefore, the person gets more gregarious and outgoing and loud and so forth. Um, so it, it is a disinhibitor. Uh, the interesting thing about it is, is that oftentimes it kind of unmasks or unrestrains uh, things that you feel when you're not intoxicated. Um, impulses essentially so when you're not intoxicated you feel the impulses but you restrain them and alcohol simply takes the uh, locks off so to speak so um, we have uh, the slowed uh, neural processing uh, reaction time decrease or increases so it takes longer and longer to respond um, you have uh, memory disruption uh, processing Um, you have memory disruption, so um, either the person won't remember. Uh, more extreme cases of alcohol intoxication, they may black out altogether, but you have the disruption of memory, partly because of the impact of alcohol on the brain itself and the memory system, uh, even in the limbic system, because remember in the limbic system we had the hypothalamus. Um, Self-awareness and self-control are also impacted. Um, you see people do things that they would never do in real life because of alcohol. And um, impulsiveness follows suit, uh, which is just another way to p talk about the loss of self-control. Um, impulsiveness. Um, and then the last one, which I don't think you can underestimate, is something that we refer to as uh, expectancy. And I'll just put expect here. Uh, expectancy, uh, the social context in which we um, have or take alcohol in um, is directly impacted by the context in which we do it. And so uh, if you're drinking solo, uh, you will experience the effects of alcohol far slower than in a group environment. And that is an impact um, of the expectancy effect in alcohol. Um, parties are a place where people will often re react with, um, I don't usually get drunk this fast. And that's part of the expectancy effect as well. So that's depressants. Now, uh, let's turn our attention to barbiturates, which is the next segment. All right, we need to talk about just one, a uh, couple more uh, that are part of the central nervous system depressants. Um, and the alcohol is the most accessible um, and prevalent in terms of these depressant drugs are concerned. The, the first one uh, is the barbiturates. Uh, and they, they function a lot like alcohol uh, does. 
Uh, oftentimes they are anti-anxiety type of medications. Um, uh, examples of these would be, and some of these you probably have heard of, is Valium. It's probably the most well-known anti-anxiety medication. Uh, another one is Librium. And again, they are used that way. Now, there are some, we because of the impact barbiturates have as a central nervous system uh, depressant, uh, what that means is there is a um, high lethality rate. In other words, uh, you can use these to um, uh, kill oneself in suicide. And so uh, because of that, we have developed other medications that are not as high of an abuse rate or as high of a uh, suicide rate connected to them because of what they do to the body itself. Um, the second class of drugs um, that fall in the CNS depressant category are o opiates. Um, and if you've ever had surgery, uh, these are uh, a lot of times pain-killing, uh, pain-relieving drugs. Um, a good example of that would be morphine. Uh, a street drug uh, in the opiates would be heroin. And uh, a close cousin, which oftentimes is used to substitute for heroin, is a drug called methadone. And it doesn't have as debilitating effects socially and otherwise as heroin, so oftentimes it's used as a substitute. And then, of course, uh, from morphine, uh, we get a lot of other drugs that oftentimes are substituted uh, because you can't really take morphine for a long period of time. Um, you can, but there's, it's a little bit like heroin. It just destroys somebody's life. So we, we uh, have drugs like Percocet, um, Vicodin um, is another of those. Um, the uh, codeine uh, is another drug that, that falls in these categories. Sometimes the, the one thing about codeine is that sometimes you'll see it in cough medicine because it is uh, anti-emetic. In, in other words, it doesn't, uh, it prompts or it keeps people from throwing up and it also impacts the cough reflex. Um, and sometimes doctors will use it in um, uh, cough medicine like that. So opiates um, and then also barbiturates are the two major classes, other classes of drugs that fall into that. Uh, specifically, uh, they, uh, they each depress neural activity, uh, opiates lessen pain and anxiety, barbiturates. Um, the, the upside is it also is anxiety, but then you also have uh, memory impairment and judgment, which is also impacted by them as well. So um, each one has its side effects that have to be uh, have to be weighed out uh, in order to be to be used at all um, in a therapeutic setting. <clears throat>